Thank you so much for joining us for today's message. We believe God is actively working in your life, and we would love to hear about all that He is doing. If you feel led, please take a second to share your story with us at amen at freedomchurch.sc. If you would like to partner with our ministry financially, you can do so by going to freedomchurch.sc forward slash give and just select the giving option that works best for you. Thank you again for joining us. We hope you enjoy today's message. We are starting a brand new series and season really for our church uh, this weekend, if you've been here before, it's one of my favorite seasons that we participate in as a church and we call it overflow. We're asking God to continue to overflow in our church and in order to do that we know that he will have to overflow in our lives. And so we've been asking and praying already that God would give us an overflow of uh, just continuing to see people far from God but uh, close to you to find freedom in Christ here. That we would continue, continue to see an overflow of people who are in authentic, real relationships with people and beginning to deal with some of their stuff through the power of the Holy Spirit. We ask that God would give us overflow in our souls and an overflow of joy. Um, we ask that God would give us overflow in our wallets so that we could be blessings to those in our community and that our community would truly know that we are here as a church and that we would continue to be able to serve and bless our community um, as we want to. In fact, we were able to do that this past Saturday, just yesterday. We had served Saturday and all around our community, this church, Freedom Church, was making a difference. In fact, what we've prayed all along the way is, God, would you let our community miss us if we ever went away? And so we just want to be the type of church that if for some reason we went away, that the, all, that the community would go, oh no, what's going on? Where's freedom? What's happening? And that we would have an impact in their lives in a way that they would miss us. And so we saw that happening yesterday as we had served Saturday and so many people were involved in that. And I think it's something that we would love to see you jump in as well. Adopt a block or serve Saturday if you're not already. And so we're, we're going to ask God for overflow during this series, asking him to bless our lives. And have you ever been to uh, one of those yogurt places where you, you go in and you get the yogurt and then there is the bar of all of the different stuff in front of you. Everybody had to throw yo. You've had yogurt in your life. None of you. None of you have had it in your whole life. All right, wake up. Wake up. You're here with me. All right. It's just participatory. When I ask questions, you have to raise your hand, talk to your neighbor, shout out loud, that kind of stuff. All right, so yeah, so you go in there, you know, you get your ice cream, and which is great. We've got some chocolate ice cream here that's coming out very drippingly. So uh, we've got some ice cream. I like vanilla. How many, how many of you like vanilla? Anybody in the house prefer vanilla? It's the number one ice cream. Always voted number one because the smart people like vanilla. And so um, we, I love vanilla ice cream, but we've got some chocolate ice cream cut out here. And, you know, you get your ice cream and you got to go over to the bar. And then they've got, you know, you got some chocolate chips. You can toss some chocolate chips on there. You, you've got, oh, I forgot to turn it on. <laughs> that might help. All right, there we go. Now we got to stop it. It's going to go over. And so you got the chocolate chips. You, you've got the, you, you love these mini little M&M things because they like, you know, are crazily good. And they're so many. You, I just throw an extra few of those in there. Uh, you know, a few of those. A few chocolate chips for you guys. You all love those. And um, if it hits somebody in the eye, I'm sorry, we do have insurance. And so uh, you, you get it. It's great. You, you take it over. And, you know, there's always the counter. And you came in with your family and you're like, oh, you know, 50 cents, whatever, for some ice cream and no big deal. And so you've got the 50 cents, you know, and you're not realizing that that's per ounce and that your family is going to get $58 worth of ice cream and toppings. So, but you bring it over and they weigh it. And, and when they weigh it, it's right about that time that you look over and you're like, oh, I missed a whole section of the topping bar. I didn't even see that. I was so busy. And, and you want to go back over, and you want to go back over and get that, that um, you know, they've got that marshmallow substance. I'm not really sure what it's made out of. You probably don't want to know. But it's like white marshmallow stuff. And you always see that last minute. Or you see they've got hot caramel last minute or hot you know, chocolate, you can, chocolate fudge you can put on. See all that last minute. And it's always like the 16-year-old kid, punk kid who's working the counter. You know what I'm talking about. And they won't, they're not going to weigh it again for you. They don't even want to weigh it the first time, much less the second time. So you're looking and you're just kind of giving them that eye of like, can we just, can I just get a, like, can I get that just to one more thing? Because you want to, you want to go over and put like a few, uh, a few, never drop an Oreo. Just uh, blow it off. It's good. All right. So 
You put an Oreo on there. You you see they they have like whole cookies. You've seen that? I mean, you got whole cookies going on there. You got cookie. Then you while you're over there, you go ahead and get a few more M&Ms is what you want to do. But they're looking at you like, no. But what if the owner came in and was like, you know what? Knock yourself out. Don't even worry about weighing it again. Just knock yourself out. And they've got, I mean, these places have like, they got like whole pieces of pie, you know. And you're like, it's just a way for people to way overeat and call it toppings, you know. I'm going to get me some pie on top of my ice cream here. That's what I need. A steak? Yeah, that'd be great. Let me get a T-bone. Some, yeah, I don't like the broccoli. That's not so good. And so I saw that at the fair. There was a whole cart full of fried vegetables at the fair. Did you guys see that? Like nobody wants vegetables. And you don't want to fry. You want to get your Twinkies while you're there. That's what you want to get. And so, but anyways, so you go over and you just start loading it up. Um, and it does melt in your hands, by the way. I'm just letting you know. They say they don't, but they do. And so you're loading it up here. You're putting some more stuff on there. And, I mean, you're just overflowing the whole thing. And then you come back, and you've got the sticky hands ready to go because he said get all that you want to. And now, as I'm thinking of this picture, I'm thinking about the way that God wants us to live our lives, that he wants us to have overflow in our lives, more than we could ever possibly imagine. Imagine, more than we could ask for in our lives. He wants us to have overflow in every single area of our lives. That he wants more for us. That he's not saying less, less, less. He's saying more, more, more. I want to give you so many things for your life. And he wants to overflow in our lives. In fact, there's a, there's a verse in the Bible that speaks of this that we've used all eight years of Freedom Church when we've done this overflow season. We've preached on this verse, Luke 6.38 and it's Jesus and when Jesus is speaking with some, some folks, he's teaching them about the kingdom of God and he's saying that this is what the kingdom of God is like and this is what it's like when the kingdom of God is here in, on earth and we get to live within the confines of who God is and what he is and we live within what, this is how life can look and as he is teaching to them he teaches to them in 638 of Luke, he says, don't hold back, give freely and you'll have plenty poured back into your lap. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, brimming over, you'll receive in the same measure that you give. Did you catch that image just there? The image that is of you go to the market and Jesus is talking about you go to the market and you buy grain and they take the bag and they fill it up with grain and you go to the front to buy it and, and they look at it and they go, wait a minute, wait a minute, that's not all that it can hold. And the merchant actually comes out and pushes down and presses down and says, now you've got some more room, go and fill that up. And so you go and fill it back up, you bring it back over to them and, and they shake it a little bit and they shake it down and they get some more room in there. And this reminds me, every time we read this verse, it reminds me that sometimes God has to shake up some things in your life in order to make room for his presence. He has to. And so you're, you're asking for more of God, but you're going to have to get some things out of your life. You're going to have to shake up some things in your life, move some things around in your life, have some different perspectives in your life. But he says he shakes it, and then you take it over, and he goes, you know, here's some more. In fact, just he says, just hold open your, your, your shirt like this and let it just come over into your lap. I'm just going to give you more than you could ever possibly ask for more than you can imagine. It's going to be overflow in your life. And, and it's, it's the same as the vanilla ice cream. I have to admit that Jesus, as he always is, is so much smarter. Grain is so much easier to talk about with it overflowing than vanilla ice cream because it gets kind of sticky with vanilla ice cream. But you get the point. It's just like when we get into the yogurt shop. We want it overflowing. And Jesus says, this is the super added life that I have for you, more than you can imagine, sprinkles on top, amazing, incredible life. And he says, this is what I've got for you. And this is what Jesus is praying for us to have, is the presence of God in our life, the kingdom of God in our life. And he's praying for us to have that. And so, and then I believe that as we see that Jesus is praying that, that as your pastor, I want you to know, that's what I'm praying for you during this season. I'm praying for every single one of you, that you as we go through this season together, that you would see how much more God wants for you. In fact, I want you to understand that. That God is not asking for something from you. This season in our church is not for something from you. This season in our church is about what God wants for you. And he wants so much more for you than you could ever even try to imagine. And so I'm praying that for you. I'm praying that God 
would shake some things up in your life. I, I'm praying that he would make some room and radically change some things in your life as we go through this season together to show you how much more he wants for you and what he wants to do in your life. And so I think God has a word for us uh, this morning from the book of Haggai. You can turn in your Bibles to the book of Haggai, if you will. And uh, if you don't have your Bibles, that's fine. You can look on the side screens. And we're going to go over to the book of Haggai and see what God wants to teach us about overflow and where we get into a position where he can overflow into our lives. Haggai chapter 1, verse 1. It says, In the second year of King Darius, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, son of Sheatatel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Josedak, the high priest. This is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say, so, so God says through Haggai to the people, these people say, he's saying, you say, you say, the time has not yet come to rebuild the Lord's house. The time has not yet come come to rebuild the Lord's house. What are they giving God? God says they're giving him excuses. It's just not time yet for this to happen. It's just not, the time just hasn't come for us to do that. The, the time has just not made itself, it's just not the right timing, it's not made itself available for us to rebuild the temple right now. The time has just not come for us to rebuild God's house. And don't we have that in our own lives that we just have excuses as to why we're not doing what we know we're supposed to do. We have excuses in our life for why we're not going forward with what we know God has told us to. We have excuses in our life of why we're not serving the way that we know God has called us to serve. We have excuses in our life. The time is just not right. The time is just not right for us to do that with our family. The time is just not right for us to increase our faith that way. The time is just not right. And, and so God says, listen, this is what you say, that the time isn't right. It's just an excuse. And just to give you just a little bit of history, Haggai gave this word from God. It's really convenient when the Bible tells us exactly when it happened. But it happened basically in September of the year 520 B.C. is when Haggai came and gave this word from the Lord. And so Haggai comes and he says, hey, this is what I want to say to you. Now, the, the interesting thing about that timing is that this is a time when the Jewish people had been back in Jerusalem for about 18 years after they had been set free from being in exile for, to the Babylonians. And so they had been in exile for all these these years and they've been in living in exile and now they have been freed and brought back to Jerusalem and they've been there for 18 years. For the last 14 years, the rebuilding of the temple and the place of worship and the, all of that has ceased for the last 14 years. So nothing has happened. Now there was a glorious beginning. In the very beginning, the book of Ezra actually tells us this about the beginning when they first got their freedom. Like when they first came into Jerusalem and were like, what is up? Let's rebuild the house of God. God God has set us free. Amazing things have happened. Like they were really excited about it. And Ezra tells us this is how it went down. It says, when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests stood in their apparel with trumpets. I think that our pastors should get apparel and trumpets. I think that that would be awesome. But, but we won't do that. But, and, and the Levites, that's the worship leaders, the sons of Asaph, with symbols to praise the Lord, according to the ordinance of David, king of Israel. And they sang responsively, praising and giving thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercies endure forever toward Israel. Then all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. And so they started in this glorious beginning. They did amazingly well. They, they went out for it. They were going for it. They were all in. They had a big party to celebrate it. That They had laid the foundation. And then somewhere along the way, despite the, the glorious beginning, after a few years, the work stopped. It was mired in discouragement. It was derailed by, you know, a lack of uh, just encouragement or re uh, by focus or, you know, maybe they couldn't get their building permit. I don't know. I don't know what was going on. Something was going on for them, but for some reason they stopped the building of the temple. And we have that happen to us too, right? I mean, it's not just excuses for us, but it's excuses when we started gloriously. 
This excuse is when we, man, we were off to change our families. We were going to spend more time at home. We were going to our boss and telling them we couldn't be late anymore. We were going to eat at home. We were going to make some arrangements in our family to have Bible study together. We were going to talk about the Bible together. We were going to pray together. We were going to do all those things together. And then we started out gloriously. And we were going to join a small group. And we were going to, our church attendance was going to be great and awesome and all these things were to happen and we were going to do wonderful good things for God and we were going to serve and we were going to give of our time and our talent and our treasure and everything was going to go great and it started off really good and with a lot of fanfare but oftentimes the excuses come because of what has happened to us which is that we have kind of derailed and been a lack of focus and we, we've stopped and that happens to us. We get so strong. But and can I just applaud you too for, for being here? Like, like, you got here. Like you did, you, maybe you haven't been here in a long time. And that's what I say. You've done amazing things just to be here. I know preachers a lot of the times that, that we're guilty of sort of fussing at you for what you don't do. Sort of fussing at you. Hey, you need to get in a small group. And so we'll yell at you a little bit about that. And I will yell at you a little bit about that through the year and tell you you need to get in a small group. Or we'll tell you you need to join the dream team. Or we'll, we'll tell you all these things that you need to do. We'll say, hey, this is what needs to happen in your life. And, but sometimes I think we don't stop and just applaud you and say, hey, you did it. You got here. Like you went through some stuff, but you're here. You haven't been here for a long time, but you're here. You've gone through some things in your family that no one even in here knows about, but you showed up. Like it was hard to get here this morning. You didn't even want to get up out of bed, even though you had an extra hour of sleep. I mean, really, it's kind of a cheat week. And, but you didn't want to get here. I mean, you didn't even want to do this today, but you got up and you did it and you're here. And I mean, you need to be applauded because you made something happen in your life. And I just want to encourage you. And I want to encourage you because I want to say, don't give up. Like, don't stop. Don't stop where you are. Why? Because God has so much and wants so much more for you. It says, then the word of the Lord, in verse 3, came through the prophet Haggai. Is it a time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while this house remains a ruin? See, here's what's happening here. The people had built their houses. These, there were these paneled houses is what the Bible calls them. And it was cedar paneling. And so cedar wood was very expensive, very hard to get. And so if you had cedar paneled houses, this was a symbol of wealth. This was showing that you had some, some good economics going on in that time and in that place. And, and that's what was happening. So they're building these paneled houses. And what had happened was they had started to kind of get involved in their own lives. They'd started to get caught up in their own worries. They'd started to get caught up in their own day-to-day minutia and rhythm of life. And isn't it so easy to get caught up in the rhythm of life and before you know it, a day has passed and you haven't done some of the things that you said you were going to do to meet your goals. And then a week has passed and a month's passed and, and years pass. And before you know it, decades pass. And the same thing is just happening in your life and there's no change. And this rhythm just kind of takes over in your life. And that's what had happened and they were building their panel houses. In other words, they got caught so caught up in their own lives. They got so caught up in their own worries. They got so caught up with everything that was going on in their house that they'd forgotten about God. And it's easy to do. It's easy to do. It's easy to go moments, years, months without thinking about it. And what happens is, is in the time of turmoil or time of crisis, we all of a sudden call out to him and we realize, hey, wait, I didn't even ask you for directions along the way. Like I didn't ask anything about what was going, I didn't ask you what was happening. I didn't ask you how I should, where I should go, what, what I should do. I didn't even consult you along the way. And, it, and it's easy for us to get there. And that's where they had gotten. And that, now you might say though, well, what does this have to do with us in 2018 PSW? PSW is what the staff calls me, Pastor Sean Wood. And you might say, what does it have to do with 2018, me right now, PSW? What does it have to do? And then you go, oh, I know. I know what he's going to do. I, I get it. We're getting ready to expand the building over here. And so the house of the Lord needs to be built. And so we're getting ready to make a push for the house of the Lord. And we're going to build this building. And he's going to get up here and he's going to go, if everybody will give, we will be able to build the house of the Lord. Uh, come on now. And that's what he's going to do. And I could do that if I needed to. Like I can preach like that if I, if you need me to, I'll do it. But I, that, that's, I wish that what was what was going on here. I really do. But it's, it would be convenient. If that was what I could preach is, man, we need to build this building, and we do need to build this building, and we are going to build this building, and you guys are being faithful to build this building. But it is 
something that is so much larger at play here than a building. Like, like it's not about a building. It's something so much bigger than, than anything about building just this church. It's something so much bigger what God is talking about than just this, even this season, which I love of overflow and getting excited during this season. It's about so much more than that. Can I show you something that I think will change your perspective for this whole verse in Haggai. It will connect the dots just a little bit. It's from the preacher Paul, Pastor Paul, who writes, and he says this about us. He says, don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who comes from God and dwells inside of you? You do not own yourself. And I love this verse. Now, now I know everybody who does CrossFit wants to use this verse to tell me how I should do CrossFit. I understand you work out, I don't. That's not what this verse is about. Like that's not what's going on here. This isn't a verse about how you, you should eat keto and if you'll eat keto, you're in God's will. Eat your keto, I'm going to eat my steak. I don't, I'm going to take his keto. I don't even know what keto is. I'm going to eat what I want to eat and you eat your keto. I'm going to eat mido. I'm going to eat what I want to eat. Mido. I'm going to eat two, right? two dough. That's what I'm going to eat. More dough. I'm going to eat more dough. More dough. I'm going to eat more dough, not keto. I just worked it out. All right, so y'all have an elephant here when you go to the fair? Let's just take a moment and praise God from whom all blessings flow. <laughs> elephant here. My daughter, she thinks the funnel cake is better. And I've tried to teach her. The funnel cake leaves out square footage. Like they intentionally have blanks of no space. The elephant ear is purely substantive dough. That's all it is with sugar on top of it to the glory of God. And so we love the elephant ear. And, and so anyway, I, I, you, you think that's what's up. This is not what this verse is about. This verse is not about our outside of our bodies. This verse is not about health. This verse is not about run more. It's, it looks great on your running shirt. I know, you know, and I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, include run this 10 miles. That's not what it's talking about. And that's not what this verse is talking about either. This verse is talking about something so much bigger than that. Like this sort of like Haggai is talking about something so much bigger than the expansion of a, of a building. It's talking about something so much bigger than that, so much more important than that. It's talking about something that if we can get this right, like what Haggai is actually talking about, what Paul is talking about, if we can get this right, we won't have to worry about building a building. Because it will just be the natural rhythm and flow of our church to go, of course we give and of course we build buildings when we need to have more people who are far from God but close to you find freedom in Christ. And that's just what we do. It would mean if we did this right that we would never have to have these commercials up here where we kind of pitch for and make an idea for you joining a small group and all those kind of things. We, we would never have to say, hey, the dream team is amazing and you need to join it because everybody would just be on the dream team. And that's just what would happen because that would be what you do when you're doing the way that things the way that God teaches us to do things. And so God has this, he wants, he's trying to show us something that, that changes our perspective on how we look at life in such a way that if we will see life this way, it'll change everything about us. It'll change everything about our lives. And I want to illustrate what, what Paul is, is trying to teach us here. So I got this box and um, this box it's a pretty plain little box, really. It's just from a craft store. It probably costs like 2 or $3. You can go get it from any craft store. If you're crafty, you, you could paint something on it, and it would look a lot better. It would be amazing. If you're not crafty, you could still paint something on it, and it wouldn't look good. It wouldn't look better. And so, uh, and, you know, it, it's just a little balsa wood or something, a little light wood, you know, box. Really, honestly, no value to it. If some of you are crafty and I said, you want this box, you'd probably be like, well, I'll take it. But, I mean, I don't, you know, there's not, not a lot of value to it. It's not going to save you a lot of money. It's not going to give a, a lot of value to you. But, but I want to teach you something about this box. And, and this box is pretty cool this way because... Um, there's just, there's something different about this box. I'm going to sit by you. Is that okay? If I sit by you? All right. She's like, this is what I prayed for today is that he would come and call on me in church. So, so in this box, I've got something, though, that I think increases its value quite a bit. I, I want you to open the box up and just, and you can tell everybody. What's your name, by the way? Lisa. This is Lisa. Lisa, what, what's in this box? 
Oh, it's a Twinkie. A Twinkie. Now, all of a sudden, the value of this box just went up. Because Do you all remember the dark years, like 2013 to 2016, when they stopped making the Twinkie? And all, all hope was lost. And so what we did, those of us who appreciate fine cuisine, we went out and bought boxes of them in advance because they announced it. And so then we had the Twinkie. But, so all of a sudden, this is, this is a little bit more valuable. But I'm going to let you hold this, and you can, you can just hold that. You can have that, actually. I'm just, that's my gift to you today. Thank you for coming to Freedom Church. Now, I want you to add something else to this box. Here's, here's what I've got right here. So I don't know if y'all can see that, but Lisa is going to help me. I want you to count that. Put your, hand your Twinkie to your neighbor. She won't steal it, I promise. What's your name? Cheyenne. Cheyenne's not going to steal the Twinkie. Lisa gets it back. All right, so just, you got it out there. So you count. I'm going to go two, four, six, eight, ten, a hundred. Oh, no, sorry there. One hundred. All right, two, 120. Good. Okay, she's counting again. All right, hundred. Go. Two, four, six, eight, two hundred. Two, four, six, eight, three hundred. Two, four. Two, four, six, eight, four hundred. Two, four, six, eight, five hundred. Two, four, six, eight, six hundred. Two, four, six, eight, seven hundred. Two, four, six, eight, eight hundred. Look at that. We got it right. Last service we got eight hundred eighty, which I knew there was eight hundred in there, so our math was wrong. We were not going to ask her to be on the counting team. That's not. That wouldn't be good. So put that, put that in there now. So there's eight hundred dollars. Close, close it up for me. In this box. Now, how many of you now would say, if I said, anybody want this box? everybody in the place want this box, right? I mean, some of you, you're not going to raise your hand no matter what. You can keep the Twinkie, by the way. Thank you for helping. And so uh, $800 changes this box, right? All of a sudden, you're like, I, I don't care. I don't, we can paint it, not paint it, throw it away. I don't care what we do to it. I want the box because I want what is in the. And see, here's what we do is we spend most of our time in modern-day Christianity trying to figure out how to make the box better. And, and so we're like, man, let's, we, we could bedazzle the box or we could, put, you know, we could take some things off the box or we can make the box prettier. And we can, you know, it's, it's just our whole lives. We, we can do better things. We can follow the rules. We can get some plastic surgery and nip and tuck some things. We can add some things. We can, we can do whatever. We'll make the box look better. And so what, what, what Jesus, uh, Paul is trying to teach us, rather, is that it's not what is the outside of the box. It's what's in the box that makes it so valuable. And he says, you are the Holy Spirit-filled temple of God. And so when Haggai is talking about the house of God, Paul would say, hey, by the way, you are the house of God. And so when Haggai is talking about don't build paneled housing, worrying about the outside of things, he said, don't worry about the outside of the box. Don't worry about where you're going to sit the box. Worry about what's in the box. The box's value gets increasingly more when what is in it. And so when there's nothing in it, there's nothing, no value to it. There's some Twinkie in it. There's a little bit of value. But when you go ahead and put $800 up in it, there's a lot of value now to this box. And so where this box goes, it's important that we know where it is. All of a sudden, this box's value has increased. And what Paul is trying to say is that there's something in you. You are the house of God. Like God wants to do some things in Berkeley County, and he's going to do it through you because you carry around the Holy Spirit and the presence of God. He wants to move in people's lives and your family and in your workplace. And the way he's going to do that is he's going to show up to your family and he's going to show up to your workplace. How? He's going to get there not by Ubering. He's going to get there by you. You are the spiritual Uber for the Holy Spirit. He's carrying you all around. You're carrying him all around, giving him access to your life. And so Haggai says... Then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Is it a time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while the house of God remains, this house remains a ruin? Now this is what the Lord Almighty says. So God gives, he says, so, so you're the house of God. I want to do some work in you. I want, to do work, I want to do something, I want you to work on something that is inside of you. Something that makes, something that makes you uh, who you are, its value even increase. And he says, now this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. In other words, there is a way. God has something for us. And here's the deal. I've, I've learned it in all of my life. Your, your direction will determine your destination. Like, so where, where the direction you're heading in is going to determine your destination. And if there's a place that God wants you to be, the direction that you take to get there then is so important. So God has a way. He has a way for us to get somewhere. And he's saying, I want you to get, I want you to carefully check your ways. In fact, my sermon title this weekend, if you want to write it down, is you better check yourself 
before you wreck yourself. Because that's what God is saying to us. He said, you are the house of God. And I want you to check yourself, check your ways. What way are you on in every area of your life? In every area of your life, I want you to see and examine them and see, am I where God would want me to be? Am I where God is calling me to be? And that's what we're going to do over this next time together. Because look at what he says. This is moving on. In verse 5, he says, give careful thought to your ways. And look at it, verse 6. He says, because here was, here's what happened. You have planted much, but have harvested little. You eat but never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes, but are not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. Some of you are like, I think my wife has that purse. I've, I've, she's got, that's the one she's got, I'm pretty sure. Do, do you ever feel like this when it comes to your life? I mean, you ever feel like, like you work harder and longer hours, but you seem... To have less? Like you're like, man, wait a minute, I'm working more than I ever have in my whole life. And I have less. Like how does this work? You have the family that you always prayed for and that you knew would be a blessing. You wanted to be a blessing, but now somehow they've become a burden. And you can't figure out why, why is it that you can't get along with this wife, this husband that you prayed for? These children that you begged God for, but you're like, I'm just not, I'm not producing the joy that I thought it would, or you, you enter, enjoy your stuff. Like you have all this stuff and you're enjoying your stuff and you have more stuff than you ever thought you would have in your entire life. You never thought you'd have this much stuff all around. You got stuff, and, but you just can't get your fill. You gotta get more stuff. And you gotta get newer stuff and better stuff. And your neighbor's got some stuff and you'd like to have their stuff too. And you just can't figure out why it's that way. And you, you feel like, you should have more money. You're actually making more money than you've ever made and you ever thought you would make. I think most of us get to that place in life at some point where we go, I never, never imagined I would have this job, this opportunity. This, just never imagined that this, this would be where my life would even be. It's amazing. And yet, I don't have anything to show for it. In fact, what I've got is more credit card debt. And what I've got is double mortgages and what I've got is nothing left at the end of the month. How in the world does it happen like this? How am I not like there are holes in your purse? And by the way, how amazing is it that God's word written 2,600 years ago is still so relevant to who we are right now? Like, like, I mean, people say, oh, the Bible's stale. I mean, look at this. This is written 2,600 years ago and it plays exactly like that in our lives today. But let's skip to verse 9. And God gives us the results of all of this disobedience that's going on, on the 14 years of, of disobedience. You expected much, but see, it turned out to be little. What you brought home, he says, I blew away. Yeah, stop right there for a minute. Because I think sometimes we give way too much credit to Satan. And we, well, Satan brought all this stuff into my life, and the devil, the devil's out to get me, and this relationship didn't work for me, and God just doesn't want me to be married, and this, this thing, I, man, this, this thing happened, and now we got this car repair that we got to make, and now we don't have any money, and we just finally got a little bit of savings. And what God is saying here is, God is saying, wait a minute, no, I blew away those things. Why? Because sometimes what we see as punishment, God sees as protection. He is trying to protect you from what could ruin your, he said, I'm going to blow it away before you blow it. Because if you'd have married that man, you wouldn't have been able to be the wife to him that you need to be. Because I got some work I need to do on you before you get somebody like that. I, I got to get, I got to get something. He's trying to show you, hey, do you see how a $400 car repair just sent your whole life into turmoil and now you're living paycheck to paycheck. You don't have a dollar in savings. Do you see that maybe if you did it my way, if you went, if you'll check your ways, because you're going to blow it. You're going to wreck yourself if you don't go my way. Do you see how you're not doing marriage the way that I called you to do it and that there's nothing but turmoil in it? So I'm just going to keep bubbling underneath the surface. And you see, we give Satan too much credit. He had to go to, Satan had to go to God to get permission to mess with Job. Sometimes it is God who comes into our lives and is doing some things in our life to show us how brittle the foundation is that we've built our life upon when we build it on our, build it for ourselves. And God wants to say, look, I'm, I'm going to do some things. 
I'm going to shake your life up. Why? Because I want to punish you? No, 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 no. I've got so much more for you. Why? Because I want something from you? No, 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 no. I've got something for you. And if you think this is all there is, I will blow it away so that you can see how much more I have for you. And I've got more than you could ever ask for or imagine, God says. Why did he blow it away, he says, declares the Lord Almighty? Because my house, which remains a ruin, while each of you is busy with your own life, Therefore, because of you, the heavens have withheld their dew and the earth its crops. I called for a drought on the fields and the mountains, on the grain, the new wine, the olive oil, and everything else on the ground produces, on people and livestock, and on all the labor of your hands. So he says, this is the destruction that comes when you disobey. This is the destruction that comes when you go your way, when you go your way. You've got a way, I know. But remember, Scripture tells us there is a way that seems right to a man and it leads to death every single time. But God says, I've got a better way. If you'll you'll follow me, I can bring unbelievable overflow to your life. But look back at verse 7. It says, this is what the Lord God Almighty says, give careful thought to your ways. And before he gives us all of what happens in verse 9 through 11, he, he gives us three ways that we can avoid all of that stuff. Three ways that we can get rid of all of the, the, the things that are going on in our lives to show us that we need to go God's way. Here's what he says. Go up into the mountains and bring down timber and build my house so that I may take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. The first thing he says is go up. Go up. He, he says you've got to come to the only source, the only one who has any clue of what you need to do with your life. You, you've got to come. I'm the only. Don't go to your friends. Don't go to your, your family. Don't go to your feelings, please. Your feelings lie to us and are t- totally not right most of the time. And he says don't go to your feelings. I want you to come to me. I want to increase your faith. I want you to come to me. I am the source for what you need. I want you to go up when you do that. And the reason God wants us to go up is because that's the only perspective that a children, children of the Lord should ever see. A child and a daughter, a son and a daughter of the king should only see from this perspective. He says, listen, you were built to be tall. You were built to be up here, go up and get a better perspective of things. You were built to be tall and you endanger your position as a child of God when you lower your perspective. And for many of us, we go to other people and go, hey, what are you guys seeing from down here? What, what are you guys seeing? And listen, it's like a giraffe taking directions from a turtle. He should never do it. A giraffe has got different perspective on everything. And as a child of God, God is saying, you've got a source. Come to me. I have everything you need. I know the way. If you'll come to me and get your perspective, I will give you everything that you need and I'll show you the way. We've got to go to the source. He says, go up. Go up. And you're going to have to change some things when you get a different perspective from God. Like you have to, you're going to have to go to God and, and, and how you live your lives, how we arrange our schedule, our time, will change when we get God's perspective. It has to. Like it can't just be what we're seeing from our perspective. When we get up and we be able to see from his perspective, it should change. How we balance our budgets, it's going to change when we get God's perspective of things. And the way he tells us to balance our budgets and to organize our finances. How we have friends and relationships, it changes. How we do marriage, it changes. Who, who, what priorities we have in life, it changes when we get that perspective. And listen, you were built, made, created to have God's worldview. He put it inside of you. You have a, a piece of him. He says we are the image of God when we were made. We have a piece of him inside. And now you are carrying the Holy Spirit of God. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit walking around with access to God and access to his thoughts, access to his way. And so we have a better way. He says go up and get it. Then he says the second thing, bring down, bring down. And I love this about this verse because we have to bring down what was already there the whole time. Like during the whole 14 years. And wasn't God so patient? Isn't God so always so patient with us? The whole 14 years, there's trees up in the mountains ready to build the house of the Lord. The whole 14 years, they're already up there. The whole 14 years, the, the, everything is already available to them. The whole 14 years, he's so patient. And he is with you too. So patient. 
He's already given you everything inside of you that you need to be the person that he's called you to be. It's already there. You're the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit of God is already there. He's already given this church every person is here that it will take to go to the next season for us as a church. He's already given us everything we need to build this church. He's already given us everything we need to be able to do. It's already there. And I love this too about it. Now, this is not prosperity gospel. This is not saying if you sow, you'll, you'll, you'll reap so much. It's not saying this anything about finances as far as you'll be rich if you are blessed God or anything like that. But I want to show you something because I think it's important to see. At the same time that they were building their paneled houses, they also already had everything they needed to build the house of God. Like it didn't take not building the paneled houses. It was the order of things that they got wrong. They built their houses first and then they said, well, we don't have time. We can't do it. It's just not the time for that. And God says, it's already there. I've already provided everything you need. Go up. Get my perspective. You'll be able to see that everything is already there. Then bring it down. The only thing we have to do is bring down what God wanted for us. And the thing is, is we always fear. We're like, I I can't go to God because God's going to want to take something from me. I can't go to God and get his perspective because he's going to want to give me something, take something from me. And here's the truth. What did God do? He gave them something. When they went to God, he said, I've got something for you. I've got everything you need. All you have to do is now follow me. And then the third thing it says is to build. To build. I can't hear that word build without hearing Genesis. And in Genesis when Jesus is talking in 16, uh, chapter 16, verse 18, he says to Peter, he says, Now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock. And he says, and upon this rock, he's talking to Peter, he says, I will build. Everybody shout out Build. I will build my church and the powers of hell will not conquer it. He says, I'm going to build something. And here's the thing that I believe God was saying to the people, and I believe he's saying to us, and it's one of the things that keeps me motivated, is Jesus said he's going to build his church. And Jesus is going to build his church with or without me and with or without you. Jesus is going to build But God says, you've got a chance to go up, get my perspective, and then you've got a chance to bring down what I give to you, what I impart to you, whether that is an impartation of wisdom, whether that is an impartation of time that he gives us, whether that is impartation of talent that he has given us, whether that is the impartation of treasure that he has given us. You go up, you bring down. And by the action of bringing down, you will get a chance to come along me as I come along beside me as I build. But God will build it with or without us. But I want to be a part of it. I want to be a part of what He is doing. I I want God to build something even bigger and greater and more in Berkeley. I want one day for there to be a conversation in heaven that goes on like this. You know, it was those people in Berkeley County started that church, Freedom Church. Oh man, Paul, come on, you gotta hear about this. John, you gotta hear about you gotta hear about this church. Because they got a God perspective. They changed and some things in their lives they were pressed down upon and shaken together. And then they just overflowed. And for years and years and decades, they overflowed. And tens of thousands of people were reached by the gospel because of their overflow. And it overflowed into generation after generation and story after story. And person after person was changed. And there will be a gathering of the tens of thousands of people that this church affects one day because of the simple fact that someone decided that I will go up, I will bring down, and then I will build. And I'm going to build alongside of God. Look at what what happened? Look at what happened. It says, Then Zerubbabel, son of Sheadatel, Joshua, son of Zadok, the high priest, and the whole remnant of the people, listen to this, obeyed the voice of the Lord, their God, and the message of the prophet Haggai, because the Lord their God had sent him, and the people feared the Lord. They obeyed. See, the, the, the differentiation is not about what you learned today. It's not about the conviction that you will have, and I hope you have much. It's not about the dreams that God will give you. It's not about the inspiration that you'll have. The differentiation between the getting to the destination will be your direction. And your direction will be decided today based on that first step that you take in obedience. And then another step of obedience. 
It's long obedience in the same direction over and over and over again. I'm sticking to it. I'm going God's way. There's something inside of me that that draws me to obey. Something inside of me that says there's a better way. I'm going to do it God's way. And so he says they obeyed. And then look at the Haggai. Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, gave this message of the Lord to the people. He said, I am with you. He was with them when he was patient. He's with them. He was with them when he was letting a seed fall decades earlier on a mountaintop that would grow up a tree that would one day be the one that they would bring down to build the house of the Lord. He was with them when they were in exile. He was with them when they walked out of exile and freedom. He was with them when they forgot him. He was with them. And you carry around the presence of God. And he says, I want you to work on our relationship. I want you to work on who we are. Because I've got something for you. I've got, I've got so much. I, you're going to have sticky fingered it's going to be just toppings in your lap. You're going to walk out going, I don't know why, but today I got blessed. And I don't know why, but today I've got overflow in my life. And God wants to do something with you. He wants to do something. Can, can I just tell you that some of you have let your past be a barrier to what God wants to do with you? That, that people quickly walk past their past. He says, I'm with you came to tell you, you haven't been with me, but I'm with you. I've got plans for you. God, would you allow us to understand your plans? As we go into this season, God, we're thankful for you. We're thankful for all that you're going to do. Would you allow us to receive everything that you have for us? God, we're thankful. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, we're going to, over this season, we're going to do a couple things. During this season, one thing we always do, and it's, it's one of the best parts, honestly, of what we do, is that we have an overflow offering. And it's just really our chance to bring down. We go up, we ask God, we say, what do you want us to do? What, what do you have for us in the future? What do you have for us in 2019? And every year we've asked that question, what do you have for us next year, God? What do you want to do through this church? We want to be ready for it. So in this season, in November 18th, we'll take up our overflow offering. And here's what we ask everybody at Freedom Church to do. Just to go up, ask God how you can be a part, then bring down and build. And we'll all give above and beyond our tithes and our offerings to support what God's going to do through this church and to be an overflow and how he's going to overflow next year so we're going to be ready for it. So we'd ask you to be a part of that. We'll be telling you more about that as well. And so you'll find out more about the overflow offering. And uh, just your obedience in that has always surpassed my expectations. Not God's, but it's surpassed my expectations. And I can't wait to celebrate with you um, after we take up that on November 18th. We're also just going to ask you during this season, try to be here every week. Just go through this season as a church, asking God to shape and mold you. We're going to look at just some practical ways of how God has a way for our life. And it's during that season that we really learn, what does God want for me? What does he have for me? What what does he want for me, not from me? And so as we respond in just a moment, we'll go to the crosses and we'll ask God if there's any place that we need to repent. And we'll do that at the crosses. Or maybe you want to go to the candles. And I think this would be a great time to go to the candles and to say, I'm all in. God, you got every part of me, every bit of me. I'm all in for this. I, I'm, I'm, I want overflow in my life. And just light a candle as a, just a symbol of that. And you can take communion back at the back of the room as well. And we love to take communion because it reminds us on a weekly basis that Jesus died. He gave his broken body, his spilled blood for us. And there's nothing more powerful than that. So we recognize that. We celebrate that every week. There'll be prayer team back in the back too if you'd love to pray with someone. And then we'll sing, praise God for all that he's done, celebrating what he has done for us. So let's continue to worship. Let's continue to respond. And uh, I'm going to pray. God, thank you so much for this time. Thank you for all that you have done. God, we pray that as we worship you, that God, in respond to you, 
that God, you would be alive in our hearts and our souls and in our lives. In Jesus' name, we thank you for what you're going to do. We respond to you now as we continue to worship. Amen.